Scotty updated us on his brother George uh, is doing much better, uh, healing better from his um, foot surgery and infection. And I want to keep them in our prayer uh, for continued healing. Uh, we want to continue to pray for Lindsay Abrams as she heals from her uh, sinus surgery and is trying to get back to work. And uh, it's kind of a long recovery. Uh, we want to keep Kathy Mandarin in our prayers. Um, I believe she was to have foot surgery this past week, but I hadn't received an update there yet. So are there any other prayer concerns we want to share? All right, let's go to the word in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for being with us here this day, bringing us here. Lord, we may be few, but Lord, we know that your presence is with us and it's good to come together in your house and to share with one another to be filled with your spirit lord we know that there are many who are in need of prayer and healing and that you are the ultimate healer we ask that you wrap your loving hands and arms around these people and give them comfort give them strength and give them hope lord be with their families as they Try and help them and comfort them and take care of them and be with those, Lord, who we know are, are many and, and just need your guidance and love. Lord, we just give you thanks again and praise you and ask that you be with us this week. Lift us all up. In your name we pray. Amen. Praise team. I do have one other thing that I forgot. I'm standing here looking at it. I'm going to pass this around if you would like to bring, um, help us out with the coffee bar, or serve with the coffee bar. Uh, I'm going to pass this around and just write your name down um, if you'd like to do it on a certain Sunday and put your name and number on there. Uh, we would appreciate it. Good to see everybody's smiling faces. Please stand and let's raise our voices in praise to the Lord. Just to send me, become my. 
this time. Uh, it's very good to ask Tim Starkey. Uh, he has a good message to share with us. Uh, appreciate him coming today. Good morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to this place this morning to worship you. We come to make it all about you, to make you the main thing. Father, we come to give you thanks. We thank you, Father, for all that you do. We thank you for all that you've done in our lives. We thank you for all that you're going to do. Father, we know that we fall way short. We fall so short. We're, we're all sinners. But Father, you continue to walk beside us. You continue to love us. You continue to give us your grace and your mercy. And we love you for that. Father, this morning we ask that you would bless this sanctuary, bless this congregation, bless this message. We love you, Father, and we lift this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Tim Starkey. And uh, like I told the first service, I have some good news. And some bad news. Uh, if you're like me, the good, the, you like the bad news first. <clears throat> the bad news is uh, you're kind of stuck with me this morning. The good news is I don't talk very long. You probably get home early today. Uh, most of you know that I'm not a preacher. I'm not a public speaker. I'm not a Bible scholar. Uh, but I am a Christian and a follower of our Lord Jesus Christ. When I was asked this morning, Chris uh, Smith uh, asked me to speak, and I gave him the standard answer. I'd have to pray about it, and uh, it's not something I'm comfortable doing, and it takes a lot of prayer to get me up here, I'll tell you that. But I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed, and God was silent. He stayed silent, and uh, I was relieved. Uh, after several days, I thought, well, I'll call Chris and tell him I just can't speak. And then the way, as the way God does it in his timing, he spoke to me. He said, uh, do you remember the poster you saw hanging in the bank a few years ago? Well, that poster read uh, that the teacher's always silent during a test. So again, I went back to, to, to God in prayer, and I said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll get up there. But what is it you want me to speak about? Again, no answer, no answer. And finally, I heard two words. He said, have faith. So... Here I am. It was uh, about 12, I think 12 or 13 years ago, God called me in to do prison ministry. Uh, and then again, I, there again, I said, what God could I possibly have to offer these inmates? I probably should be in prison myself for some of the stuff I did when I was younger. Uh, but I went kicking and screaming and I lost that battle too. Uh, so I went. I didn't have any idea what God was preparing me for, but I later found out about seven years ago, my own son uh, got sentenced to the state penitentiary for 17 years. And God was just preparing me for that time. Uh, but that's another story for another day. Uh, this morning I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the, the ministry I'm involved in. It's called Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, if any of you are interested in uh, looking it up. But the Kairos prison ministry uh, involves <clears throat> usually around 40 volunteers to go into the prison, go behind the walls, for, we go in twice a year for four days to witness to uh, approximately 40 inmates. It's usually one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, before we go in, we meet for Five Saturdays, we, we go in early, we go in at like five or six in the morning, have breakfast. We spend all day till five or six in the evening, uh, joining up, being a team, we get to know each other. So when we go into prison, uh, we're on the same page, the same agenda. We also, we either raise or contribute $250 each man to go in for that weekend. And if you do the math, that's $10,000. What that money is used for is we cater the meals in for these 40 inmates and the volunteers for that weekend. That's a, that's a lot of food uh, for four days, uh, 80 men, and 
It's quite a feat to get that much food behind the walls of a prison. The security is strict, and they search every bag, every box, everything for every day we go in. So it's quite a feat. We also, before we go in, uh, each volunteer bakes 70 dozen homemade chocolate chip cookies. Same recipe, and they have to be the same size. And if you do the math on that, that's over 30,000 cookies. That's a lot of cookies. Let me tell you, when you carry them in, that's a lot of cookies. But the, the inmates, we put the cookies on the table for everyone, on all the tables, and they eat all the cookies they want all weekend. There's another time during the weekend that we go into all the, the uh, uh, dorms and uh, cell houses. We give every inmate, we hand deliver every inmate a dozen chocolate chip cookies. They really, all the inmates in the prison look forward to Kairos weekend. Well, <clears throat> the first time I went in, I, the first thing we do is we have a time of introduction where we uh, introduce ourselves and the inmates get a chance to stand up and introduce themselves. That evening there was a gentleman named Mike. Mike stood up and, and he said, uh, I'm Big Mike. I'm here for the food. I'm not here for the other stuff you're putting out. I'm here for the food. But if you want trouble, I will give you trouble. Mike was a, a man of probably in his mid 40s. Uh, had arms, I think they were that big. I don't know, they were big. Had no neck and was strong. He was mean, tough. We later found out that he was the meanest man in camp. When he would walk down the walk, uh, the other inmates spread out, let him go. He, he was, uh, Mike never stood a chance in life. Mike had been in prison since he was 17 years old. He grew up in Gary, Indiana, in the tough, tough st streets. And his, his, uh, his mother was in prison. His father had died in prison. And his brothers and sisters were in prison. He never stood a chance. And I'm, you're probably wondering why they picked him to be in this, in this room, this Kairos ministry. The, the, the staff at the prisons always pick the, try to pick the worst of the worst to that'll, that'll come, can come to these events. When they change, uh, they, when the population in the prison changes, they see these men change, the whole lap, attitude in the prison changes, at least for a short time. Well, the weekend progressed and it was Friday evening and um, I was in the back of the chapel and we were singing and I looked over and Mike was in the back of the chapel and he scanned the chapel to see if anyone was looking and, and they weren't and he, he went over and picked up a songbook and came over and went back and started singing. And I said, wow, either God is softening this man's heart or he really likes to sing. I really wasn't sure which one. Well, Sunday evening we, we have a closing before we go home uh, and we invite our the spouse, the volunteers invite their spouses or a few friends, and the alumni Kairos, uh, the ones that have been on the walk before, get to come. And uh, the inmates on the walk that weekend get to have a chance to get up and say a little thing, say what, how their weekend has gone. Well, Big Mike stood up. He said, "I'm Big Mike." He said, "I don't know what's going on." He said, "But God's working on me." He said, "He has a lot of work to do, but He's working on me." He sat down. A few, a few short minutes later, another inmate stood up. He was a white gentleman, probably in his early or mid 50s. He had great big glasses and straggly hair, skinny. He was somebody that Mike surely would never have uh, been involved with on the prison yard before this weekend. And God had touched his heart. He started to speak and he started to cry, he started to weep, and, and uh, Big Mike came up, he was the first one on the pulpit. Put his arm around this man and he looked over at the people who were sitting at his table. And he said, get up here, this man needs us. And they laid hands on him and prayed over him. What an amazing God we have that can, that can soften a man that was hard as Mike in just a few short days. It's something that we as humans, there's no way it would take, we could do it in 50 years. Uh, when the weekend's over, uh, we don't just drop these guys. We don't forget about them. A few volunteers, and I was sharing with somebody out in the hall a minute ago, uh, 
they have to have a, a, a volunteer before they can have what we call a prayer and share. And the alumni, Kairos guys come into the chapel and we, we have about an hour and a half meeting every once a week and but before COVID now, we haven't since COVID, but uh, there's a time of devotion and there's a, we break into small groups. We talk about what God has and or hasn't done for us in the past week. When the evening's over, we all circle up. And I, what I started to say was I speaking to somebody else. I have been in a room with 40 inmates by myself. They have to have one volunteer, but and, and that's, uh, but God, he's in the room. You, you don't, there's nothing to be afraid of, nothing to be scared of, because, uh, you know, I have the full armor of God on. But anyway, we circle up, we hold hands, we recite the Lord's Prayer. And the leader for that evening, who's always an inmate, says, uh, who is the church? And the answer is, we are the church. And he says it again, who is the church? We are the church. So what is the church? If, if, if you ask people on the street, uh, you're liable to hear the answer that, well, it's that building at 5th and Perkins or 6th and Main Street, or maybe it's the building out on West on 52. But is that the church? This morning we're going to talk a little bit about what the church is and what the church isn't. The church isn't a building. The church isn't a steeple. It's not the stained glass windows. It's not the choir. It's certainly not the pastor. It's none of these things. The church we see in the Bible had none of these things. They first met in the upper room, and when God's Spirit showed up in Acts 2, they ended up taking to the streets. The church isn't a building. Hello? Hello? What is the church? Is the church a building? Is the church a pastor? Or the staff? Is the church the music? The tradition? Or the ministries? These are all good things. But they are not the church. Take them away and the church is still here. Why? Because you are still here. The church is you. The church is you with a purpose. The church is you on a mission. The church is you with a plan. A simple plan to plug into God at a weekend service, to charge up in a small group community, to live out using your gifts and passions, and to pass on your faith to those who do not know Christ. When you and I live like this, all the things we used to do in church become things we do as the church. God desires it, the world needs it, and we are called to be it. What is the church? The church is you. The church is wherever you are. You are the church. The church is the body of Christ. The church consists of everyone, everyone, everywhere who has a personal relationship with Jesus. This means that Jesus can be in your home, Jesus can be in your car, Jesus can be when you're on vacation. Church can even be at Starbucks. Church is ecclesia. Don't be afraid of Greek words. Ecclesia is the Greek word for church. It literally means a community or group of called out ones. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness and into his wonderful light. There are a lot of people that say, I've got God and I've got the Bible. I don't need the church. But the Bible disagrees. We're commanded to gather together. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We need God and we need each other. Not only do you need the people in this room, the people in this room need you. God wants us to carry the truth to the whole world. He wants us to evangelize. Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Many of us, or in fact most of us, uh, really need improvement in this area. We think we need to keep our religion to ourselves, but people can't come to know the Lord if someone doesn't introduce him. How many of us know someone that doesn't have Christ in their lives? I'm sure all of us. How many of us are bold enough to broach that subject? I bet there aren't many of us that feel comfortable talking about Jesus. We think we need to know the answers to every question, but we don't. We think we need to know the scriptures better, but we don't. All we must do is make that introduction and let Jesus do the rest. He can and he will. And I'm just talking about the people that we know. So how do we evangelize with people we come in contact we don't know? It's been my experience, you just be yourself. Uh, people will see that there's something different and they want to know what it is. When they open that door, don't be afraid to enter. In other words, don't be afraid to share the love of Jesus. Some people may reject you, and that's okay. You did your part. But let me tell you, I've had the honor to make that introduction more than a few times. And when you see them accept the Lord as their Savior, there's no better feeling. Not, none. Any, none. Just none, nothing to compare it to. God wants the church to be at peace with itself. God doesn't want us to gossip. There is no place in the church, or any other place for that matter, for gossip. Gossipers often have the goal of making themselves look better and others look inferior. Gossip is potentially embarrassing and hurtful, even if they mean no harm. If we don't agree with something that's going on in our church, what do we do? Do we go to the leadership? Do we go to the pastor and ask him? Or do we talk among friends, uh, looking for someone to agree with us? I'm, I have to admit, I am guilty. I've done it. And I still do it sometimes. I don't do it out of malice. Uh, I do it sometimes because I don't understand. Sometimes I just don't agree with what's going on. Tradition is another thing that can divide our church. If you oppose change for no good or godly reason, then your adherence to tradition can cause division. As Christians, we should try to unify the church. To pursue unity, we must continually pursue change. We must change in the same way that a living person grows and changes, hopefully toward maturity. We are part of a living church. As I mentioned earlier, my son got in trouble about seven years ago, got sentenced to 17 years in prison. Without a doubt, the hardest thing in my life I've ever went through. I have a, a wonderful wife and a family that supports me, but if it weren't for the love of Jesus Christ, I probably wouldn't be standing up here talking to you today. Some people never experience the love God has for them, and that's a shame. You say, how can I feel this love? First, you must have a relationship with him. You must spend time in prayer. You must study his word, and you must believe. God will never turn away from you. Well, do you remember Big Mike? Big Mike's been out of prison now for about three or four years. I talked to him last year. Mike still has a relationship with our Lord. He's staying out of trouble. 
Praise God. Praise God. I will leave you with this. Recreation, entertainment, and the social gospel will never take the place of what the Lord wants. Let's never worry so much at what others want to do as to what God wants us to do. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Would you stand and recite the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Who is the church? Who is the church? Amen.
Precious love.